Good morning, Living Grace Church. <laughs> How are you guys doing this morning? All right. I'm going to invite you to stand up and join me in worship this morning. Remember to have an open heart and open mind for the Lord this morning.
blessing that I do to my kids all the time. As, as soon as they were born, I pray that. It's directly out of the Bible.、Uh, it's Leviticus and、uh, Deuteronomy. Mentioned, you know, God asked Moses to bless my, my people like this. And there,、uh, when he described blessing, it's not something pouring down on you. The description there is that God, all knowing God, moving in the universe, He turns and l o o k at you and l i s t e n to you. That's a blessing. So God's here everywhere. Let's ask for blessing. Him stopping what, he, what He's doing. Turn and your ears on you. w a n t e d to listen to you. So let's turn our eyes to Him. Give Him blessing back. He's central of everything we do this morning.
I just wanted to share a little story with you guys. Um, so I had my first teaching job here at Living Grace. This week, I got to be the music teacher for VBS, which was really awesome. I really enjoyed taking care of the kids. Um, there was this class that I had, and in the class, there was this little boy in the back of the room. And I didn't really notice him till like, maybe the last two days of VBS. And uh, my mom came in to help the last two days as well. And she told me, like, have you talked to the little boy in the back of the room? Like, there's a little boy in your class, and, you know, he's not really taking part in the class. He's kind of just doing his own thing. And she's like, well, like, maybe you should give a chance to talk to him. Because she talked to him before me. And turns out that he had a big interest in this video game that I also play. And, um... I just, I didn't, you know, I, I was too busy taking care of all the kids, you know, I was just in my own world trying to make sure they all stayed in one area, like, and so the next day I come back and I'm having this open mindset trying to like, make sure that I say the right things to this kid, and I go up to him and I start talking to him about the video game and the way his face just lit up, like he wanted to be part of my class. All of a sudden he wanted to take part in playing the instrument singing the songs and like uh, I was regretting it because I was like dang I wish I would have said something earlier but just having that interaction with that kid you know it reminded me of like how God leaves the 99 to go after the one and I wish I would have followed in that example but there was a reason why it happened you know I got I got to remember why you know our God is so important and he's so special and he takes the time to find everybody's interests in this room and he can connect to everybody in this room individually because he finds that you know he finds that in each and every person here and just the power in his name too like the fact that we have the ability to use that name you know the fact that we have you know the honor to use his name when we're in battle too you know and just what an amazing God we have you know I just get reminded of it's just such a blessing. So for this last song, I just want to invite you guys to invite the Lord with you right now. Take part in the, you know, song. Use his name, you know. I know that we all, when we're struggling, there's always a time where we go to God and we fall on our knees and we need to, you know, ask him for help. So right now, if you are struggling, if you are going through something and, you know, you feel separated from the group and, you know, God's going to come after you. He's going to find your interest, and he's going to come for you. You just have to call upon his name. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, cause it's all that I can do. In desperation, I seek heaven, and I pray this for you. I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name.
every promise he is faithful to Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over. everyone's hearts and minds today, Lord, as the message goes over each and every one of us, Lord, that you would bless Pastor Richie and his speaking today, Lord, that you would 
you would let the words flow, Lord. You would bless his mind and his heart, Lord, as he begins. We just thank you once again, Lord. We pray for safe travels for everyone here today. And in your name we pray. Platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back So many critters to see Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra Ha ha, brain coral living in the sea Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish The most wonderfully made is me Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made Different than a wombat What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made Different than a dingo oh, yeah. You know, we ain't just talking about another branch on the family tree. We're talking about a different tree. Uh, we're talking about trees. Thought we are talking about animals. Uh, animal trees. Just sing the song, mate. A bit faster this time. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a crop, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. We're made different. For example, have you ever heard a camel try and sing? No, but birds can sing. Fair point. Very repetitive lyrics, though. <laughs> Let's try it faster. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made.
Good morning, everyone. The Western Desert Hot. I'm Michelle. <laughs> I haven't been up here in a while. I missed this. Um, we'd like to welcome everyone or anyone who's new today. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we do have a gift in the back. If you would take a gift, and in the gift, there's a connect card. We love to connect with you and just place it in the tithe box. Um, so thank you for that. If you're watching online, good morning. Welcome. Uh, there's a, a click on the website where you can connect. Please connect. So this beautiful stage, beautiful decor. Um, we had an amazing time at uh, VBS last week. We had over six, about 60 kids attend, and they were able to hear about the gospel and how needed they are and how valuable they are and how loved they are by God. So it was a success. Thank you. Um, many of them received Christ. So big, big, big shout out and thank you to Miss Joanne for all that you did and all of her helpers. It was amazing. So now that VBS is over, we need help cleaning up VBS. <laughs> So if you can make some time uh, right after church today, if you're able to help, uh, just help us tear down and clean up, get the church back to its original decor. Um, our youth camp, our little humans, are away at the Camp Cedar Crest. My little teenager is there. Um, let's lift them up that God fills them up, uh, works and change everything that's needed in their their little bodies and minds and hearts uh, we lift up Sam and uh, Ray that are the leaders there at the camp um, so this is they they got there yesterday so they're there until Wednesday so just keep them in your prayers lift them up um, so sister Aura, her project with budget suites back to school program that's back very excited about that so her event is August 6th where we are uh, just helping and giving to kids for back to school, all their school supplies, backpacks, everything they need. So if you're able to help, um, if you have kids of your own and you're able to grab a little extra for some kids that really need it, that would be great. We do have a bin in the back that you can bring it to church and drop off. You can connect with Sister Aura to work with her if you're able to do so. Um, but that's August 6th. Uh, that event is... Um, between 8 and 10 that day. Um, do we have any youth today? If so, okay, they're all at the camp, great. Um, it's Mission Sunday, one of my favorite Sundays, so Pastor Richard is going to come up and chat. And it's so nice to see all of your faces. Have a blessed, blessed day. Well, good morning, everybody. I've had... We'll see if we, not, I won't drop it this time. I've had three people or two people ask me this morning, what's up with the pineapple? So I thought, you know what? It's time to bring it up here and explain what's up with the pineapple. So the pineapple is back there every week. And it, this, is, this is where we, and I don't, it, it's just a symbol, but uh, it's where we kind of collect our missions offering. This church has so much stuff going on missions-wise. It's very appropriate that today we're, where is Mission Sunday, but um, we forgot one thing about VBS. Um, there was a missions focus with our VBS this year, and I challenged the kids. Uh, we were to it was to raise uh, money for Feed My Starving Children, um, or Hunger Fund. It, uh, that's another organization. Um, but anyway, I challenged the kids uh, on the first day. They their first two days they had raised enough money to buy 331 meals. So I challenged them, and I says, guys, I think that you can do better. Um, and I challenged them to raise enough money for 1,000 meals. And, you know, it's not disappointing, but uh, they only raised enough money for 1,433 meals. As a missions pastor and somebody that sees the world in a, a little different context, that is amazing. That means 1,433 kids won't go to bed hungry. Won't go to bed hungry. That, that changes everything in my mind. Um, so it, it's also very appropriate that today is Mission Sunday because in 12 hours I'll be on an airplane for Panama with my team. 
Uh, I want to explain to you just a little bit of what's going on, and then I'll show you a video, just a real quick 20-second video of where we're going, we think, um, because there's uh, some changes that are possibly happening as we speak right now, but we'll figure that out when we get there. Um, but uh, we have a team of four leaving from here uh, that will meet up with a, a doctor from the UK and one from Portugal. Uh, so there'll be six of us that are going and then meeting up with uh, about 20 two or 24 Panamanian doctors, nurses, interpreters, drivers, cooks, um, the whole team. So we'll have a, a team of 30 people that are heading into the Darien Rainforest. Um, just to explain to you a little bit how, how to get there, um, it's, a, it's an eight-hour, nine-hour flight from here at Las Vegas to Panama City. And then we'll get into a cattle truck or something uh, that will take us uh, about eight to nine hours over uh, a drive to get to the mouth of the river that runs into the Darien Rainforest, and then we'll get into a canoe for about eight and a half or nine hours um, with all of our provisions, 30 suitcases, 55-gallon uh, drums of gasoline, and everything for our venture down. Uh, we'll be probably about 12 miles by the river from Columbia. Um, so that's where we'll actually land. Um, and I'll show you this real quick little video of, of where we're going. The house that you see, um, we'll be living under it. Just, I didn't share that last service, but uh, we'll be living under it. Um, I didn't share that with my team either, did I? Uh, <laughs> you guys will be fine. It's all good. <laughs> and then I want to introduce the team. So play that little video real quick. Bien, aquí tenemos una vista de los ranchos de Cañas Blancas. Esto es Caña Blanca. Allá abajo corre el río. So the only way to get there, she's saying, is by the river. There, isn't, are, there are no cars, there's no electricity, there's no running water except for the river that runs by the place. Um, so it's uh, very, very, very uh, remote. And we will be ministering uh, along with our Panamanian, our, 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 really our global partners, to the Kuna Indians, who are the indigenous people of that region of the world. Um, again, it's a, it's a, anytime one of you guys are ready for an adventure, um, just let me know. Um, I, I will take you. Um, but uh, again, back to the pineapple. This is, this is really where we collect our, our missions offering. And there's all other ways to give, and we don't really care how that happens. Only that we do give. Because, because uh, it's, it's people like this team that I'm going to have. You guys come on. Uh, I'm going to have uh, come up. It's people like them that, that answer the call. And, and this is... A, a team that I could not have put back, put together myself. Um, we've got uh, Joyce, who's married to Sam Wright and, and is a member here at the church. I've got Verena, who has been with me on multiple mission trips. She is my voice. Um, so when I need to speak, I speak to her and she speaks to everybody else uh, because I don't know the language. Uh, <laughs> And then we've got Irene that uh, we met through a mutual friend in, in Foursquare that hooked her up. And she just got back two weeks ago from Burundi. I sent her, we sent her with uh, uh, Foursquare Disaster Relief Medical. And so she was in Burundi for a couple of weeks doing uh, some mission work there. But this team is going to represent you, Living Grace. Um, all of us can't go, but this team is going and we'll meet up with another team to represent you. Uh, and the body of Christ here in the United States. So um, I'm so proud of them. I'm so excited. I can't even stand it. It's been like two years since I've been able to go on a summer mission. I'm dying. If I could get on the airplane right now, I would be gone. But we have about uh, 12 more hours of training. We started last night at 5 o'clock and went uh, well into the evening. And it's a, it's a pretty big deal for uh, the training that I... I promised them, the very first thing I promised them when they go into training is I will make you uncomfortable. Um, and I think I've done that so far, uh, but we just, just started. <laughs> so, and I think uh, Pastor David's got something, uh, another quick missions announcement uh, that he wanted to make, and then Pastor Richie's going to pray us, pray us out of here. You all remember Karen Grubbs? Okay, I asked her a question, 
before she went back to Washington State where she's with her family. And next month, she's flying to Uganda. And I asked her, what would put a smile on your face? And she said, caramel. Caramel. Caramel candy. Caramel. Caramel. It just tastes good, and it sticks to your teeth. So, um, but she, caramel. And then uh, chocolate. Things chocolate. Things chocolate with caramel. Um, cookies and other stuff. And I remember a little, um, a little, um, it'll be on a list. In the back, there'll be a box. We'll bring it next uh, Sunday. So bring um, uh, uh, some caramel, some goodies. Let's put a smile on her face. This is not so that she can consume it while she's in the States. It's while she's home in her few hundred square foot house that uh, we want to put a smile on her face and let her know we love her. So begin to collect. Uh, when you get your own candy, get a little bit more for for um, Karen and bring it to uh, Debbie and I and starting next week and we'll make sure and get it up to, to Karen before she goes to Uganda. All right, could you scooch in because I want to... You just, yeah, amen. Would you all stand with us, please, as we pray for these guys? <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Father, thank you for this team um, that's heading to join the rest of the team that is, some are already there and some are in, in route. But, Father, we pray um, your protection upon them. We pray a special grace uh, for them, I, I gather that they are learning new things about their destination as they go. And so we thank you for their courage to go and to, um, to, to just be your hands and your feet to be a blessing to those folks. And it's not that we've got some great knowledge to deposit with them, but so they know that we are standing beside them as they preach the gospel, and as they reach their nation. Father, we pray for, for uh, many, many miracles to happen. We pray for uh, the miracle, the greatest miracle of all, of salvation. Uh, we pray for um, uh, supernatural words of wisdom and knowledge and um, uh, courage as these folks will be uh, maybe doing some things they've never done before. But we, uh, we entrust them to you, Lord, and um, thank you for Pastor Richard uh, for uh, bringing all of this stuff together and uh, being the minister uh, to the world that he is. And we pray a blessing upon him and his family and these folks and their family. God, that you would use them for your glory and that you would bless them. We look forward to their, their safe return. God, uh, keep them from the sicknesses and the stomach things and the issues that so often can happen. Uh, give them endurance uh, when, it's, when they're questioning why did I do this again, Lord? Uh, may they know that be, because you have called them to be there. And so we bless them now, Lord, as they bless these folks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Yay. Living Grace, for sending us. You may be seated. We're out. Off they go. See you in a couple weeks. See you in a couple weeks, brother. Don't forget my dark chocolate. Uh, yeah, I'll find <laughs> I'll find yeah. Um, no, I want the fresh cocoa. Is that what it is? You can get cocoa? I know you can, brother. I'm just kidding. Um, we have an um, um, amazing, um, again, I just, I just want to take a few minutes, and the, the amount of work that goes into blessing these 60 kids uh, was remarkable. Uh, we have some people who are incredibly gifted, they're humble servants, and they just, it, it is a tireless effort to transform this place and then clean it all up, which is happening after service if we didn't say that. So if you were a part of the team that, that served at Vacation Bible School in any capacity, we just want to honor you. We know your services to the Lord. But could you just stand up just real quick, please, if you were part of that team for, yeah, amen. Look at, look at all the folks. Thank you. 
Uh, we give glory to God uh, for, for, for what, he is, what He has done through you and, th- and for the young people to have such a timely message at, a, at such a, a, a time. We have, if you take a step back just briefly, we have, um, I don't have the time to show you the video of Pastor Ram who was in the Philippines and their outreach to some 200 people uh, in one of the villages that they're, they're doing. Uh, and they were having a little worship set. And you do know who's leading worship, right? Yeah, Miss Ariza was up there, yeah, doing her thing. And uh, uh, so we have that. We have uh, um, uh, this team heading off to Panama, uh, and many of you next year are going to be a part of that team. We have um, a local ministry that happens. We're we're collecting backpacks for the for the um, for the budget suites coming up. Um, and uh, uh, it's just uh, there's a lot of really cool things that are happening. And and trust me, it's just not about events on the calendar. But it's about being taking these gifts and talents that God has given you as a church and using them for His glory. It's an amazing thing. It, it's an amazing thing to see how we can minister in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even the outermost parts of the world. What a blessing it is. Uh, we have a baby dedication. And so if I could have um, uh, uh, Sean and Kalina come on up and bring your whole tribe and let me give you a little, a little bit of an uh, explanation of what baby dedication is. Yeah, come on up. I know, y'all, yeah. <laughs> Baby's hungry now. Baby got to eat. Like, everybody look that way. No, just kidding. Come on up. It's a little crowded up here. <laughs> Woo! I mean, you know, pastors get nervous when we do this. Let me tell you why. We, let me tell you the why behind what we do. So there is a, um, uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, um, uh, Hannah was unable to have children. And she would, would pray to God for a son over and over and over again during the multiple times that she would go to the temple and, or to the uh, tabernacle. And there was no, um, she felt ashamed. She wanted to have a child. And she said, what's up, bro? <laughs> J- just hold on, man. And um, I work alone, uh, but uh, I know, all eyes on baby. Uh, so, uh, so she prayed and prayed and prayed, and, 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 and God answered her prayer because she said, Lord, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him back to you. And I mean, after the baby was weaned, that's what she did. Moms, check it out. She took her boy, dropped him at the tabernacle, and said, I'll be back in a few months, man. This is your young child to grow up. Uh, she literally dedicated him to the Lord. And all Samuel did was, was bring an entire nation of people back into alignment with God uh, and be- to become the first of the great line of the prophets. Um, uh, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, King David even. Well, he was the first. He introduced this, pr- this, this prophetic ministry um, into uh, the nation of Israel. And so what we do in following that tradition is we, we dedicate children to the Lord. It is a public proclamation of, of what um, uh, uh, you're saying. You know, God, uh, we are, we're, pray- we're saying a prayer over baby. What's up, man? And we are saying a prayer over the parents. And uh, though they don't live here in Las Vegas, we as a church are saying, yeah, we're with you. Because it takes uh, mom and dad, grandparents, uh, aunties and uncles, it takes everybody, uh, and it takes the Holy Spirit for wisdom and guidance, right? And so that's kind of the tradition behind it. And so um, before we begin, um, Dean, very interestingly, um, means, means like a strong Lord. Yeah, What's up, you. my brother? He's strong. He's looking at me saying, why is that, man? Yeah, it means um, uh, a strong Lord. And so we're going to pray for, for this young man to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Okay? And so that's, that's Sean and Kalina. And Kalina was talking about Vacation Bible School. And uh, we were telling her that we had it this week. And she said, oh, my gosh, I, I grew up in vacation Bible school. So for all those who served in the children's ministry back in the day, here you go. Here's the fruit of your labor. So what do you think, Mom? You think I can hold them? Well, I can't. Yeah, you just want to grab that microphone, huh? Would you stand with me, please? Yeah, baby boy. Yeah. 
Father God, thank you for this young man. May he be a strong, uh, strong in your in your word and strong in faith. Father, we thank you for the blessing that children are. Um, and we thank you for mom and dad and that you would give them wisdom to raise um, baby Dean in your word and to, to, to have the, um, the spirit to understand that one day they will launch this young man uh, into whatever you have for him. So a blessing upon them, a blessing upon everyone on this stage, Lord, that represents this tribe and that this young man would always know that he is loved and that he has uh, family around him. And most of all, God, that you are with him. And so may he be strong in you and the strength of your might. And we bless this young man and we dedicate him to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we can walk a little few steps away. Yeah, what's up? Say hi to everybody. Say hi. Hi, see those people? They have lots of little ones too. See, see he's looking at you going, they look tired. Yeah. Don, do we have some, um, we have a few things for you? Oh, no, I think he wants to hang a little bit more. He likes the altitude. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a few things for you and... Um, Please open that before you leave, though, okay? You don't have to do it up on stage. You guys want to preach the message, too? No, we're yeah. good. Are you we're good? good? Okay, yeah, off you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Very special um, for... for uh, Very special um, as a pastor to see the generations coming back. And even though they don't live here, to say, oh, we want to dedicate our, our son at church here. That's a, that's a cool thing. That's a cool thing. So I think I did pretty good. How about, uh, what do you think, Dean? I think I got a chance. I think I'll be all right. A, a, a man of, of great stature, um, a strong man, um, once made a comment about, uh, in a very vulnerable moment, he talked about his weakness. Uh, something that men don't typically do. Um, we tend to be quiet about those things. And he's talking about his, his, his life, and he said, he said, you know, I, I don't understand my own actions. Uh, I, I, do, uh, I, I don't do what I want, and then I do the very thing that I hate. I don't know if any of you could under, feel that. First service, everybody was like, <laughs> you know, I know you guys are, you know, <laughs> like, like, there are times when I think things, or I say things, or I do things, and I'm like, man, I can't believe I just did that. I can't believe I said that. Like, what is my problem? You know, I have these conversations inside my head, and it's really bad when I start to answer myself. But I think, man, how long have I been a Christian? Like, I've been... I, you know, like, I've been doing this for how long? And I get tripped up over something stupid like that. I can't believe it. And I start to feel like, you know what? <sighs> oh, man, I, 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 I desire, I so want in my heart to do the right thing. And then I just fumble. And it's like, no, I, you don't understand. That wasn't, I didn't intend to be here. It just happened. Oh, well, you know, bro, I go, don't spare me. I know. Uh, I know it. But I just, sometimes my intentions start off right, and then everything goes south. And I think, see, 
I can't believe I thought that. Like, what am I, what's my problem? I can't believe I just said that. Or I can't believe I did that. Like, right? Now, does anybody here, because y'all looking at me funny, like, you know, uh, no, I see, see, you, see you clapping back there, sister. I appreciate it, yes. You know, I, and so this, this wise man said, he said, I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, people who know him would argue and say, are you serious? Now, you're like, you're, like the, you're like one of the best ever to do what you do. You're like a top five. You're a lottery pick. You're a once-in-a-generational type of follower and, 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 and leader and church planter, and, and, and everyone else after you is going to be trying to live their life the way you lived. And he said, no, man, you don't get it. I get all the platitudes and the radio and TV interviews, and everybody wants me to come speak at their church. But he says, you know what? Man, there's nothing good inside of me. And in this, in this brutal, honest moment, he says, you know what? I don't have it all together. I, 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 I blow it sometimes. And there's nothing good that dwells in me. And he wasn't making a value statement because he understands his value in Christ. But he says, man, you just don't understand. I'm weak at times. I don't do the right thing. I don't say the right thing. There's nothing good in my flesh. And he says, I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. I just, I want to do the right thing, but I don't. And I feel that. And at the same time, I think, man, can a brother get a little help? A little help? A little help? Can a brother get a little help? Please. And I'm so thankful that this great, great leader, Paul the Apostle, one of the originals, although not the original 12, but who met Jesus after he rose from the dead, in a special appointment that God had for him and a special ministry that God had for him. Man, I'm, I'm so thankful that this mighty, mighty man of God was honest enough to talk about his own struggle and his own failure because I think sometimes we beat ourselves up so bad that we don't get up. And Paul would say, no, 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 listen, man, everybody's struggling, even me. And we think, Paul the Apostle, oh, if I could just be like that. No, and Paul's like, you don't want to be like me. Be like Jesus. The answer isn't in trying harder. I gotta try harder. That's what I got to do. I got to put more effort. I got to try. Well, that's a part of it, but it's not the answer. And the next part of what he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 24 is, wretched man that I am. Could you imagine Paul the Apostle calling himself wretched? I mean, it's like, oh, no, bro, bro, you're too hard, you're too hard on yourself. Me, wretched, I'm wretched. You, you're not, okay? You're Paul the Apostle. He's like, you don't understand this battle that rages within me. Wretched man that I am. And then he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he gives the answer. He says this, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Church, can you say amen to that? Oh, thank you, God, that you are the deliverer, that you are the one who, who even though in our failures and our missteps and our mishaps and saying this and this, and which, which happens sometimes, uh, we, we, we start off so well and we end so miserably, but you know what? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who delivers us from this body of death, this body of failure. Thank you, Jesus. First and foremost, that is what we can celebrate no matter what we might find ourselves in. With the help of the power of Christ, he empowers me to overcome and, and to get beyond my own failures. And so in my life, I, like my position is set. You know, I'm, I'm born again. I, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. Christ lives within me. I'm a new creation in Christ. That is my position that will not change. Now, my practice is another thing. Think of some sort of game where the coach says, here's what we need to do. We need to do this, and we need to do that, and we need to do that. And then the game starts, and the coach calls the timeout and says, did y'all not listen to what we just said in the locker room? You're not doing any of that. Sometimes I feel that way. But my position is set. I am a blood-bought, Jesus Christ-filled 
follower to the best of my abilities, and I, I tell people all the time when I breathe my last breath, I'm going to be with Jesus in glory, and it's not because of how great I am, it's because of how great He is. That is my position. It won't change. Now the Holy Spirit would say, so let us work so that your practice reflects more of your position. Since this is who you are, let's talk about what that looks like in your neighborhood, in your secret place. You know that place you go where nobody else knows you go, but God knows and we forget, oh man, you're never alone. <laughs> I want to remind you of a few things about the divine power that we have um, and the nature, the divine nature, the, the new nature, the new creation, that there's, a, there's something that happens that comes alive inside of us. Peter says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that His divine power, the power of Christ, the power of God through Christ has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. So we have this divine power from above. And then Peter says in chapter 1, verse 4, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in this world by lust. Divine power and divine nature. Supernatural. Listen, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That power lives in you. Well, I don't feel like it. No matter how you feel, what's your position? What does the Word of God say about who you are and whose you are? Oh, it's a wonderful thing. That same power lives in us. Ephesians reminds us in chapter 1, verse 19, that the people... Paul wanted the people to know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. There's no comparison. If we try to say, well, what is the power of God like on planet Earth? Don't try to trivialize it by thinking nuclear or thinking atomic or thinking whatever depth of think you might think of raw, sheer power. No, it's beyond that. This is the one who created energy. God created energy and time and matter and space with a simple word, let there be. And there was. That power lives in us. So that power gives us the ability to live a Christ-like life, uh, like life. And that is where we're going to go today. Peter is going to give us lots of things to say, and we're going to stop and talk to Paul a little bit too about how to live the life because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is where, where, where we as the followers of Jesus live this life. And Paul would tell the church in, in Philippi, Speaking of that strength, for it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectually at work in you, both to will and to work, that is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. We have to keep reminding ourselves of our source. And our source is not our own uh, limited uh, knowledge, wisdom, and power, but it is the, it is the power of God, which is un limited, unlimited power living in you to live this life that we cannot live on our own. Now, how do you live the productive life or the fruitful life? I'm glad you asked. We have everything necessary for the divine life. That's God's part. Now, we got to work hard to cultivate it. We have everything necessary to live the divine life. He has supplied everything that we need. We're not lacking of anything. So because of that, we have to cultivate that life. We have, to, we have to realize that God does his part. Now we must do our part. God is the one who supplies the power for me to live this life. And God is the one that will help me to live out that life each and every day. Okay? He has this available to all who would run to him and all who would look to him. And so we got to get to work. 
There's work. Now, I'm not talking about salvation because that's a free gift from God. But there's a work that you and I have to do. It's hard work. I liken it to gardening. I don't know if any of you guys are gar uh, uh, gardeners and you try to grow vegetables. Like I tell people that you can actually grow vegetables in the desert, and they go, no, you can't. I go, yeah. But could you imagine just uh, taking some area in your backyard and throwing out some seeds and saying, okay, there you go. I'll be back in a month. We'll see how you're doing. We, uh, we have a couple of little gardens. We have one big one because at first... You know, so I got some really good dirt, this organic dirt. I want the good stuff. Somebody was trying to get rid of it, so they came and dumped it in my backyard. And um, I was like, yeah, I want a big garden. I was much younger then. I was much younger. I would not want a garden that big now. And it was not very big. It was just big for me. I'm like, wow, this is taking a lot of time. But, you know, if you have a garden, you understand something about it. You can't just throw stuff out there and walk away. You can't do that. There's work involved. You have to cultivate it. You got to get the right soil. And our soil is not very good. It's not conducive to growing tomatoes. Palm trees, yes. Tomatoes, no. So you got to work it, right? Uh, there's weeds. My vocabulary changed when I heard about this thing called iron crabgrass. This crabgrass started growing in my garden. I'm like, what is this? Oh, a little grass. No problem. I took it, and I pulled it up, and it went, is that all you got? I'm like, oh. I'm like, so I dug a little more, and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, ooh. How much of this stuff? They call it iron crabgrass for a reason. Fast forward a few years later where I said, you know what? Pastor Richie, zero. Iron crabgrass, one. <laughs> It's like, whatever. You know what I have growing in my garden right now? One palm tree. That's it. Oh, you can't just grow a garden and just say, hey, you know, have at it. You got to water it. That's important. And then there's bugs. I don't know if you're aware, but you got, you got these caterpillars. If you go tomatoes, you got these gnarly looking green, slimy, ugly caterpillars. They're gross. And they have little horns on the end of them. Kind of, you, they're devilish. But they are nice, for, they're nice to pull off by the horn. And when my kids were little, in particular one child, who was not in attendance today, I paid her, I paid her five cents a piece to get the, get the uh, caterpillars. <laughs> and then there was an internal revolt where she said, Dad, we need to talk about 10 cents a quarter. I'm like, hey, 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 what are you, union now? What are you talking about? <laughs> I won't say her name. Oh, I just, darn it. Yeah. You got those, and then, there's, and then one time we were going out of town for, for a few days, and I saw this really strange bug, and I said, oh, that's weird. I wonder if it's a friend or foe. I thought, ah, got to go. Yeah, it was, a, it was not a friendly, a squash bug. If you all try to grow that, let me know how you kill them, because they're ruthless. You, my point is, you want to have a garden, it's lots of fun, and there's all kinds of good eating, too. Right? You can put it on Facebook and make everybody look, think you're a horticulturist, you know. But here's the reality. It takes work. Somebody got to be out there. Somebody got to work it. It's hard work. See, if you have a beautiful garden, someone did the hard work. Someone. If you have beautiful faith, someone did the hard work. And who did the hard work? Jesus Christ did the hard work 2,000 years ago on the cross. But... He doesn't make us holy without our involvement. Growth in Christ doesn't just happen. Could you imagine going to a facility, to a trainer, and to say, hey, I'm going to lose 25 pounds, I want to increase my muscle mass by this much, or I want to have this kind of conditioning within three months, how much do I owe you? You go, uh, give me $200 or whatever it is, I don't know. You pay your bill, okay, all right, I'll be back in a month, I want to see some change. <laughs> They'd be like, hey, yo, uh, I don't think that, you don't understand how this works. Thank you for your er, payment. We will be sending you a Christmas card because you're going to be one of those. But you got, no, no, I'm a fitness trainer. I'm already in shape. You need to do the work. Oh, nobody told me that. Can you imagine? You know, growing in Christ takes work. 
oh, oh, hard work. So Peter's going to give us a little bit of an understanding of what that work looks like. Because God doesn't make us holy without our involvement, and growth doesn't just happen. If someone has been a Christian for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and yet there are basic things about the faith they don't know, it's because they haven't grown. They haven't done the work. I'm not talking about salvation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this thing called Christianity will take time, effort, and energy, and it'll be work. So, church, are you glad you came this morning? Let's get to work. Let's go to work. It's time to go to work. It's the time of just sleeping in the afternoons and, like, not paying attention to what's going on supernaturally. We need to get busy. So let's go to work. Here's what Peter says. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Now, for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, in your brotherly kindness, love. And this man has memorized it. That's why he's saying it along with me. <laughs> As I look at my notes. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Apply all diligence. That's not a word that we use a whole lot. Diligence. Apply all diligence. The Amplified Bible says it means to, uh, uh, to the divine promises, make every effort in exercising your faith. Make every effort in exercising your faith. Let's begin with a, with a, with a little bit of a reality check this morning, okay? In this life, we are going to experience pain. We will. You guys aren't surprised by that. That's not new news. And sometimes we'll experience a lot of pain. Much of the pain we experience is because of situations outside of our control. The division that you work in at work is downsizing, and you're on the down end of that. There's an accident that happens. There's a doctor's report that you get. And you're like, you, well, where did, when did this, how, and you're, you're left kind of stumbling to try to figure out what's next. Maybe it's a loved one who passed away unexpectedly or even expectedly. There's pain in this life. A lot of the pain that we experience in this life are because of things that are within our control. Uh, you can choose to obey your parents today or face the pain of consequences later. And all the parents said, amen. amen. You, could you could choose the pain of living within your means today, or in the future, you'll have to climb a mountain of debt. You can choose to live a life of sexual purity today, or you'll have regret later, and you will have regret you choose. And so some of the things that are part of the pain that we experience are because of choices that we control. Now, here's the point of even saying that, not to make anyone feel bad about themselves or your choices. That's between you and God. You're a grown man. You're a grown woman. You make your own choices. Hopefully, they're biblical choices. But here's the thing. It will take discipline today to not face tough consequences tomorrow. It will take discipline today to not face some tough consequences tomorrow. Here's the best definition of discipline that I heard from Craig Groeschel, one of a, a leadership guru that I highly respect. He says, discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. Choosing between what you want now and what you want most. That's discipline. Paul the Apostle gives this amazing example of discipline and the discipline that will be necessary when he speaks to the church in Corinth. He speaks to them in an athletic language because they all understood the Isthmian games that were happening in their neck of the woods. They understood what it was uh, to, for these athletes to train and the significance and the seriousness of the games and the competition. And he says to them, do, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. 
They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I, what's that word? I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So Paul speaks to this discipline and this work, this road work that has to take place. And he uses this athletic analogy of running. And, you know, Las Vegas is like, who doesn't want to come to Las Vegas and run? Of course, not in the middle of summer, but we have, we have all these races that take place. The, the Opportunity Village Santa Run. Now, I got to tell you. There are pe- now, go back, go back to the sign. There are people who run these races. Yeah, right there. There are people who run these races, all right? And some of them, they're not serious. They just want to, they, they're just in it for the fun of it. I got a hold of these three pictures recently from someone who attends our church. I told them I would not say who they are, and I'm not going to say who they are, but they come to first service and they sit right over there. <laughs> I didn't tell you who they were. They could be anybody. They could be these folks over here, but that would be... Anyway, so they said, hey, we ran in the, the Santa uh, uh, a fun run. For Opportunity Village, a very good cause. And I go, great. And he showed me the pictures. That's the picture he showed me. (laughs) Now look at the next picture. Oh, it gets worse. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then show, you want to see the last picture? Yeah, I got my box of donuts in the Santa Fun Run. I'm like, what? What the heck? Now you do not know who that is. I'm not going to tell you, but they come. Anyway. So you understand that. There are some people who attend these races, and they're just in it for the fun of it. And there's the Elvis run, there's the Rock and Roll Vegas run, then there's the Las Vegas Marathon. Now, some of those people, they're like, look, man, I'm world class. Don't you know me? I don't know, but anyway, um, they're trying to win. Uh, We did this thing with some UNLV alums one time. We went to Doolittle. How many of y'all know where Doolittle is? Okay. A couple people, all right. So a couple of people that are melonly challenged know where Dooley. They all been in the hood, huh? Okay. You work there? Even better, sis. So you know what you understand. Good for you, by the way. Uh, so we, we did this little bas- UNLV basketball thing, and it was like, you know, working with kids and stuff, and just a good time, and, you know, just you know, show skills training and all that. And then someone said, hey, well, after camp, we're going to have a little game. I said, great. And I said, hey, I said, guys, listen, man. Do me a favor, don't like beat up on the kids, right? And you know what one guy says, former running rebel, who's clearly past his prime, uh, he said, oh, heck no, I'm trying to win. I said, man, you're playing third graders, man, give it a break. No, man, I'm trying to win. They're going to have to learn the hard way. I said, you know what, you are taking this way too serious, bro. Do you need to, what are you going to do, go home and tell your wife you scored 30 on some second graders? Get out of here. You know, oh, you should have seen me, honey. Yeah, huh? All right, go ahead. Just remember, ankles, hips, and knees. Three reasons you don't play basketball when you're older. (laughs) Show up like, yeah, man, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. You 40, give it up, bro. Give it up. Thinking you could still dunk. You ain't touched the ball in in, in 12 years. You try to dunk. Yeah, there you go. Here comes the ambulance. (laughs) Yeah, get him over here. After camp, they handed out bags of ice. The kids were drinking water out of them. All the old dudes was icing the down their knees and their ankles. And <laughs> No, they didn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Need a little help, a little help. <laughs> I digress. Where were we? Races. Paul says this. Paul says, live your Christian life to win. Don't, don't, don't race for second. Don't be the guy in the donut shop in the, ra- the Christian race of life. <laughs> Y'all are like, what's wrong with that? Okay, you get my point. Run to win. He says everyone who exercises in these games exercises self-control in all things. Athletes have self-control. They must. They're disciplined in their training. And Paul says they get a prize that fades away. They get, they get a, a, you know, a wreath or no taxes for life. And that's pretty cool. But they get all kinds of fun things. And um, one, of the, one of the top 50 basketball players of all time was Pete Maravich. They called him Pistol Pete. And, and Pistol Pete, 
before he died, became a believer in Jesus Christ. After most of his life, with, with the incredible skills that he had, six foot five, six foot six, could shoot it, could dribble it, was a crowd favorite because of what he used to do with the ball that would just be all kinds of crazy no-look passes and everything before it became famous to do that stuff. He was sort of the front runner of that. But before he died, he, he became a follower of Christ, and his testimony is riveting. You should listen to it if you ever get the chance. And he said this. I heard him say, man, I've got more trophies. I've got more more banners. I've got more ribbons than, than, than I even know what to do with. And he said, in my attic, there is a six foot five bronze statue of me. <laughs> he's, he's like, what are we going to do with this thing? Put it in the attic, <laughs> right? Now, how many of you remember where all those old, ba- uh, where's all your trophy? Now, some of you know where everything is, but you know, remember that trophy when you were in the sixth grade and you were the batting champion? Like, where's that trophy? Who knows? But Paul says, listen, we are, we are running for something that is eternal. It'll never end up in a box in the garage. 1 Peter 1.4 says, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. There's a time coming when there's a reward coming, and Paul would tell the people, run your race, Uh, be diligent, be focused, understand the work that goes into it. When you think of these athletic games and the athletes going into strict training, no junk food, whatever that was in those days, no alcohol, exposure to extreme heat and exposure to extreme cold in the kind of a shock training thing, And, 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 and Paul tells the church, man, listen, be diligent, work it out grow. I want to read something to you out of this book, The Reason for God, a Belief of Age in Skepticism by Timothy Keller. I highly recommend this if you know someone who's struggling to find God's grace or trying to find meaning in some of the things of God. And this is what he says, speaking of freedom in the midst of all of this discipline. And he says this, Christianity is supposedly a limit to personal growth and potential because it constrains our freedom to choose our own beliefs and practices. It's too constricting. It's about a bunch of do's and don'ts. And he challenges that assumption. Immanuel Kant defined an enlightened human being as one who trusts in his or her own power of thinking rather than an authority or tradition. This resistance to authority in moral matters is now a deep current in our culture. A resistance to authority, a resistance to discipline is true. Freedom to determine your own moral standards is considered a necess- uh, as necess- a nece- necessity for being fully human. He says this o- oversimplifies Freedom can't be defined in strictly negative terms as the absence of confinement and constraint. In fact, in many cases, confinement and constraint is actually a means of liberation. And he uses the example of someone who has a musical musical aptitude who has given themselves to practice and practice and practice and more practice and more practice. And there's a restriction on their freedom because of their choices to gain something better. Now, no one would ever say to that person, you are, don't spend that much time. It's too constraining. You're losing your freedom. You're putting too much into this. No one would really say that to them. But sometimes when it comes to the things of Christ, it's like it's too constraining. It's too constricting. And yet what he says in his book, and which is true, is that those kind of constraints don't hold you down, but they free you up. They free you up because they free you up to be someone greater than you could be on your own, and they free you up to places and spaces that you could never get to on your own. And it is better with God than it is without Him because of His supernatural ability to take us places that we could never get to. Verse 5, and we're only going to go through a couple of these this morning, and we'll, we'll, we'll do some more. Peter's going to give us seven things to consider speaking of this discipline and this life. He says now, in verse 5, he says now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence to your faith, supply moral excellence, 
and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Applying all diligence. It means to go beyond the expectation. Don't just do this much. Go further than that. All diligence in your faith. Faith marks the beginning of the Christian journey. You begin by faith, believing that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. And Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. But here's what Peter says, and get this, add to your faith. Don't stop there. Add to your faith. Do that work. Don't stay where you are. Add to your faith moral excellence, goodness of life, godliness, spiritual courage in a hostile world. We don't produce these things on ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit within us. God calls us to his own virtue, so we exhibit that virtue and energy in the exercise of faith that translates in action. Moral excellence. This is how we live our life. The first pillar is moral excellence. The second one is knowledge. It's a practical wisdom, a practical knowledge. And I want to park on this last one for today, self-control. Self-control. The word used here is to keep passions in check, specifically someone who's not ruled by sexual desire. We live in a society that has a significant lack of self-control. Now, God has placed restraints in all societies to hold back the tide of evil. First of all, there's His Word. If His Word is brought into a society, then there will be moral restraint because His laws and His precepts are meant to value people, not devalue them to give people control, uh, not uh, 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 a lack of control, Uh, to to honor uh, marriage, to honor uh, children, uh, to to, to honor the poor, uh, on and on and on. And so, and so, so the Word of God brings moral restraint. The law of God, secondly, is written on our hearts. You have a conscience. How do you evolve into having a conscience? How do you get to the place where because of random random chance plus time, you all of a sudden, something deep within you tells you what you're about to do is wrong? That's called conscience. And it's placed there by God. You either have it at the beginning or you don't have it. You can't evolve to have conscience. And so we have the Word of God to hold back restraint. We have conscience that God has put within us so that people know right from wrong. They do, and they know it intrinsically because they're made in the image of God. Society has removed God to the best of their ability. They want no part of God. And when a nation does that, morality flips. And sexual immorality goes crazy. It goes rampant. Another restraint is the family destroy the family, and there's no discipline for children. It is no mistake that our adversary, the devil, is hell-bent on destroying the biblical definition of family. Because when you destroy family, you destroy a nation, and there's no restraint on children. I love the video, I wish I had it, of the mom who was at home when the riots were happening in her city, and she saw her son, her her 14-year-old son on TV breaking into the store. And she went, oh, heck no. And she ran down to the store, grabbed him, slapped him up a little. Say, you get your hiney, oh, your rear, whatever. I don't know the exact quote, but you get it. You get home, and you get home now. That's not how I read. And she hit him across the head the whole way home. He's like, oh, mom, okay, I'm sorry, mom. Woo! Sister wasn't having it. Remove the family, you remove another layer of moral constraint. There's another moral constraint called authority. The government. And say it was perfect. The law. Police. By the time we get to that, it's too late. It's too late. And you have lawlessness. And you have an inverted society where the heroes are actors and actresses 
and sports figures and who knows, maybe even politicians. And you reap what you sow as a nation. Think of all the sin that is a result of a lack of self-control. Add to that the hypersexuality of a society. And you have America. You have America. And this is why he says, in your knowledge, add self-control. Followers of Jesus should operate and live in the virtue of self-control because it's from the fruit of the Spirit who dwells within us. Um, we'll get to the rest of these, perseverance or patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, because it always ends with love. But I want to ask you a couple of application questions. Don't, don't feel like you have to answer it because it's not meant for that. What do you want m most right now? What do you want most right now? Now, be biblical. Be biblical. If you say a new husband, that, that's okay. Stop it. <laughs> what, what do you want most? A million dollars would be nice. Okay, no, no. What do you want most right now? And what do you need to choose now to achieve that, what you want most? What do you need to choose now to achieve what you want most because it will have it will take some self-control it will take some discipline it will take some work are you ready to work are you ready to grow are you ready to pull out the weeds are you ready to cultivate the soil are you ready to do the work now to ensure a harvest later i hope that we are i hope that we are because it starts in here we choose we choose. May we choose, not wisely, but may we choose biblically. Let's all stand. Father God, we just, um, we thank you for your word that, that, Lord, you will always do your part. Help us to be a people who does our part. Lord, you don't do our part for us because you want us to experience the participation of working alongside of you in us. These things are not easy, Lord. They go against our grain. They go against our, our, our nature. We want it to happen easily. And we want transformation to just happen, and it just doesn't. And so we thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to grow um, it's challenging, but your word tells us we have all that we need. The only thing I need is less of me and more of you. Lord, I'm so thankful for Paul the Apostle setting the record straight. Thanks be to God who frees us from this life of death. So, Lord, we look to you now. Have your way. Give us strength and wisdom from above. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, guys. Awesome. Hey, uh, uh, again, I want to remind you that we do have communion elements here for you if you'd like to have some quiet time of communion with the Lord. Also, that we really, really could use your help because all this has to come down, as Michelle said, and um, we also got to stack some chairs. And so if you got a little bit of time or a lot of time, we could use your help. God bless you guys. Have a great one.